What is up, Houdat Nation? Welcome inside another edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast presented by your host, Chris was welcome. Obviously, this is under Buku Media, and this particular episode, just like all the past ones, have been sponsored by Ornitos Tequila. Here's to the shot takers, the one who, like us, believe nothing great ever happens if you don't take a shot, because that's what hashtag a shot is worth taking. Ornitos, the proud sponsor of Buku Media and the Straight Up uh, Saints podcast, obviously want to thank them for their work as always, and There's a lot of stuff to get to for the Saints, whether it's football, non-football, so much stuff going on, obviously. But before I get into all that, I just want to let you guys know uh, my thoughts are with everyone who was affected this past week by Hurricane Ida. I know the videos were heartbreaking to see. There was so much destruction. And um, I am glad that a lot of the people who I do interact on Twitter all seem to be safe and their families are doing well. That was on my mind throughout the weekend. And it's, um, it's frustrating because you just sit there and you know that you can't really do anything over the phone or just over Twitter and, and be there to help. But if, if there's any way I can help someone, please reach out to me via Twitter DM and, and I'll talk to you and we'll see what we can do. But obviously my thoughts are with everyone right now who was affected by Hurricane Ida, which somehow made its way uh, to New York last night over here and was you know a little bit of a threat here as well. So my thoughts are with you guys. And because of Hurricane Ida and the impact that it did have, The Saints are not going to play week one in New Orleans. We all know that now. Instead, they're going to play in Jacksonville. We thought maybe AT&T Stadium. I know a lot of us wanted to see a college football stadium, but because of the NFL rules with the replay booth and having the accessibility to New York, that was never going to happen. So they're playing in Jacksonville was the only venue that really worked out. But there's also other reasons, like Jeff Duncan pointed out. Aaron Rodgers' record in the Sunshine State isn't that good, neither is his passer rating. So you know what? The Saints will take every advantage they can get when, frankly, they're going to lose a big advantage not being in New Orleans with 70,000 fans at the Caesar Superdome screaming their heads off and just getting loud. Obviously, that affects them. Um, But they're going to be in Jacksonville, and that led to probably one of the most tone-deaf comments I've ever seen from an NFL GM. And and Packers GM Brian Gutekunst was asked about the Saints game going to Jacksonville, and he basically said, uh, I don't think we had a whole lot of say in it. I would have loved if it was in Green Bay. Now, I know you can kind of take it any way you want and interpret it in a different way. But when you're a GM and I get it, you're supposed to defend your team, but a natural disaster can't be used as your way of saying you're inconvenienced. I think that is probably the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's ridiculously tone deaf. And I don't know why he would expect the Packers to just get an extra home game. That is not part of their 2021 schedule. So I was frustrated by it. I tweeted, I now see why Aaron Rodgers doesn't like Brian Gutekunst, which is legit because that has been the beef between Rodgers and the Packers. And I firmly believe that I would change his name and call him something else because there's a way to kind of flip it and make a a weird spin on Brian Gutekunst's last name. I'm not going to do it. If he makes another tone deaf comment, I might, but it was pretty frustrating to see that a GM just didn't get it. Like the first thing that should be going through your mind is thinking about the other people and ways you can help them, which we've seen, whether it's the Falcons or the Panthers or the Ravens donating to the Saints and donating to Louisiana to kind of get them back on their feet. And said, this guy's worrying about getting an extra home game. I just thought that was classless. Just wanted to get that out there before I get get into everything. Um, But obviously, Saints fans had a a couple of things to say. And yes, I am from New York. And in terms of what the field's going to be painted for, I I would assume, you know, I don't know if the Jaguars are playing week two, but if they are, I'm assuming either going to get a generic NFL logo or they might actually give the Saints the home field design. Either way, I'm not really too picky as to what's going to happen. I'm not sure what will happen. I'd assume that the NFL logo will be at the middle of the field, though, and then maybe they do something from the end zone, but I'm not sure if they want the grounds crew to be working overtime for the first two weeks of the NFL season, but we'll see what happens, obviously, there. Now, before I get into something that I did promise, which was the 53-man roster, or at least the current 53-man roster, and my observations and takeaways, because I got five that I want to talk about, what I really want to discuss real quick is the Saints' current situation. We know they're going to be away from New Orleans for a month, and that really scares a lot of people. And first off, there are things that are bigger than football, this being one of them. What happens now, it happens. You know, you can't sit there and complain and and worry about, oh, but this hurricane's going to mess up the Saints' chances. Forget about that. Like the, the Saints' playoff chances, Super Bowl hopes, whatever, that should always come way after family and, and friends and anything else that could be affected by this hurricane. So forget about the Saints' Super Bowl chances for a second. That being said, I don't think there's a better coach in the National Football League who is better equipped to handle a situation of this magnitude than Sean Payton. And there's reasons why, and obviously having the experience being in a similar predicament is one of them. The fact that Sean's just a great leader of men and just being able from a genuine level, being able to understand your players and know what they're going through and be there for them, I think that matters a lot. 
And I know a lot of Saints fans are frustrated with Sean Payton, whether it's him not getting extra wide receivers or him handling the quarterback battle the way he did or him constantly being loyal to Drew Brees the last couple of years, which apparently ticked off some fans. Whatever it might be, I, I'm not saying he's you know free of criticism, but he does deserve a lot of praise for this particular situation because this is where he specializes, just being that guy where you can have a heart-to-heart -heart with your player and understand what they're going through and being able to relate and be there for a moment of crisis. That's important. So I think Sean Payton is the man to handle this. And if the Saints do overcome this and we're past the first month of the season and they're able to be 500 or even over 500, I think we're going to look at this and say, okay, Sean Payton is the reason why. So I am very, very pleased and happy that the Saints have a leader like Sean Payton who can get them through a time like this. So I think that is definitely something to discuss. Now, I love you guys. Anyone listening, leaving comments. I am like dying over here <laughs> in terms of losing my voice. I don't know what the heck happened, but this really is going to be interesting. Now, let's switch over and move to the 53-man roster because there are so many takeaways and there are five in particular, and I kind of said it before, that just blew me out of the water in terms of, wow, and the first one was the cornerback rotation. We've been talking about the cornerbacks for a while, whether it's us complaining, us being pleasantly surprised. There's so many takeaways. But the one that I took is that the Saints only have three corners on their roster. Like, how did that happen? How did the Saints look at this roster and say, okay, it's going to be Lattimore, Adebo, and Crawley. That's incredibly thin. That is incredibly demanding on those three players, one of them being hurt right now. But we'll see what happens, obviously, and I don't want to just panic immediately, and I also have to point out that Gardner Johnson and P.J. Williams are guys who are versatile, P.J. being all over the field. Granted, no one wants to see him at outside cornerback, and C.J. Gardner Johnson being a guy who does just amazing things in the nickel situation. I mean, I think he is, I'm not going to say pound for pound the best, but is he a top five nickel corner in this league? I think he is, and he's only getting better. And I actually think C.J. Gardner Johnson, his trash-talking expertise limits how much people talk about his on-field skill. Like, I need to point that out because he is so damn good at trash-talking that people forget that he's a hell of a football player. So I get that the Saints have DBs that can play in the slot, but the outside cornerback depth is concerning, and there really isn't anyone out there to make a move. No one got cut that made you say, okay, maybe go after him. So it really is Lattimore, Adebo, Crawley. Injuries cannot happen. The margin of error is very, 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 very thin for these guys. So that was one of the first observations I took. I was just blown away that the Saints went with three corners. That was just crazy for me. Uh, and obviously, Saints fans pointed that out and kind of made a, their own comments about whether or not it's the right move. I don't know. I can tell you that Prince of Mukamara was not it. I can tell you that obviously guys like Grant Haley and, and Keith Washington just didn't work out. Washington getting injured. It's just, it's frustrating. It really is frustrating because if there was one guy I could keep from last year's roster, it would be Janoris Jenkins. And I think, depending on how the season goes, we might look back and be like, man, if the cap was just a little bit higher, Janoris Jenkins is on this football team. And if Janoris Jenkins is on this football team, it changes so many things. So the cornerback position and the lack of depth at the outside cornerback spot was one of the glaring things. I mean, we knew it was going to be a problem, but then when the 53-man roster comes out and there's three corners on that 53-man roster that play on the outside, and I'll go, P I'll go three and a half with P.J., not great. But anyway, let's kind of move on and switch gears here. My second observation, the Saints wide receivers, the team likes them a hell of a lot more than we do because I can go on Twitter right now and I can find about six tweets talking about how they don't like the Saints wide receiver corpse or we need another receiver or outside of Callaway, no one's going to get it done. I can find that very easily. It'll take me a second to find all these tweets. And honestly, half of them might be for me. So I don't know why I'm even subbing myself with the way I'm talking about this group. But what the Saints have said time and time again, and what their actions continue to show you, is that they like this group better than you, better than me, better than any Saints fan. They really do. So that is something that uh, I'm very interested to see what goes down in terms of whether or not we're going to see the Saints adjust their wide receiver corps. I don't think we're going to. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, so I really think that Saints fans are just going to have to brace for yet another year of, okay, Thomas can do his thing. Callaway can do his thing. Who else is going to step up? That is kind of the worry because there was a lot of receivers that got cut, whether it was Johnson from the Chargers or John Brown from the Raiders. 
Um, a bunch of other guys too, actually rookies like uh, Williams from Auburn who got cut from Denver that a lot of us were like, hey, I would love to see them on the Saints. And yet the Saints didn't scoop them up. That tells me that they like their, their receiver group better than we do. And if I had a, a freaking dollar for every time I've heard Sean Payton say, we feel comfortable with the guys that we have at that position, I'd be doing pretty well for myself. There'd be a lot more in the background than just the pictures that I can afford and put up right now. But it really is, it's marveling to me how they see the position group different. And I'm not one to judge because they know more than me, obviously. But I did think there was wide receiver talent out there like a John Brown, who is a, two years removed from a 1,000-yard season and is a deep threat. Imagine him with a Jameis Winston. I do think that would be interesting. But, hey, maybe this means that Traquan's doing better in terms of health than we think, and Deontay Harris won't get suspended, and Michael Thomas is going to come back and be at 100%. But those are a lot of ifs, and those are a lot of moving parts. So the wide receiver group left a lot to be desired. But I'm not going to be all negative. There are a lot of good things to take from this group, a lot of good things. But the, the, and the one main one is the linebacking group. Do you know how much the Saints love their linebacker corps? They love their linebacker corps so much that they kept seven linebackers. They kept Bond, they kept Demario, they kept Quan Alexander, Pete Werner, Caden Ellis, Andrew Dow, and Hanson all on the roster. And we were all talking about, man, one of them's going to get the boot. And whoever gets the boot, watch them play well for another team. Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore because all seven are on the Saints roster. And whether you like it or not, I've been saying for a while, the strength of this team is going to be the front seven. And now we're going to get to see if the front seven actually can be the strength of the team to this point where they're going to be competitive. They're going to be a playoff caliber roster because they have seven deep, seven guys who can actually make plays. And like, I know the attention is going to go to Demario and Quan, and then the secondary youngsters like Vaughn and Werner, but man, Caden Ellis and Andrew Dow and Hanson, all of them, all of them made a lot of plays during training camp and made plays during the preseason. And John Hendricks, who's one of my favorite Saints reporters out there, said every practice, Dow came up with a huge play. So why not keep these guys on there? You have young talent, affordable talent, controllable talent in terms of contract length. I like that they kept the seven linebackers on there. And while there are concerns about depth at corner, concerns about depth at receiver, there are no concerns about depth at linebacker. And I remember, guys, if I go back and pull up an old Straight Up Saints podcast from, let's say, March or April, I would probably be sitting here at this same desk on this same show saying, man, I'm worried about linebacker. Fast forward a couple of months down the road. I'm not worried about linebacker. I'm excited about linebacker, how things change, how quickly they change. It's amazing. Uh, so I really did like to see what happened with the linebacker group. And I commend them for keeping the seven. I know it looked crazy and my eyes almost kind of popped out of my head when I saw it, but I really do like that. They kept the seven linebackers. Now, another positive note, Tony Jones, Jr., was running people out of jobs in the preseason. And if he had another preseason game, which did get canceled, obviously, because of Hurricane Ida, I think we could have seen even more explosive ability from the second-year tailback out of Notre Dame. I mean, this kid might be what the Saints are missing in the run game. Like, I know Kamara's great, and I know Latavius can be a bruiser, but they were always missing one more runner, and now they have that in Tony Jones Jr. I'm really excited for this kid. And the fact that he was able to beat out Devontae Freeman and arguably beat out Latavius Murray. I think time will tell, obviously, the story. But if he starts getting more snaps than Murray, that wouldn't really surprise any of us. He was better in the preseason by a mile. He had more juice. He's a younger runner. The way he, he makes his cuts and he uses his vision, I think he fits perfectly in this scheme. And we've seen the Saints kind of take guys, whether it's a Chris Ivory or Pierre Thomas, and, and all of a sudden you put them in this role, you put them in this offense, and they turn into a really good role player. Why can't Tony Jones Jr. do the same thing? So that is another player who you look at this roster and you say, man, there are concerns, but if I'm looking about the optimistic take and I'm taking that half, you know, glass half full approach, Tony Jones Jr. belongs in that approach because he's a young player who has experience with Jameis Winston because they worked out a lot, is really young, gives you more juice to that offense that, man, if him and Kamara could become a nice one-two tandem at the running back position, that's going to be really great for this offense with an offense that, like I said, is lacking wide receiver talent. You add a running game, that opens up a lot of things. So I'm really excited about Tony Jones Jr. And after the first preseason game, truth be told, guys, I was a little worried that he might be a guy that the Saints cut and regret like a Boston Scott. And you know what? Boston Scott for the Saints, I don't blame them for cutting him at the time because they were loaded at running back. I didn't want to see history repeat itself. It's not. Tony Jones Jr. is here to stay. And I'm really excited to see what he does this upcoming season. Now, the fifth and final observation what the hell are the Saints going to do at kicker? We all want to know. They just cut Aldrich Rosas, who 
was hot and cold like a Katy Perry song. I mean, it was just very weird to see what happened. He could nail a 50-yarder and then shank a 30-yarder. It was just all over the place. And that kind of is the epitome of a guy who in New York was an all-pro one year and two years later is not sticking on the roster. It's just kind of how the kicking game goes. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. Will Lutz's absence is going to hurt this team at some point unless the Saints magically figure out this kicking situation before the season opener, which, by the way, check your watches. They got about nine days to figure it out, so not a lot of time to do that. Uh, so I am a little concerned. I, I tweeted this, and I got a couple of questionable – I mean, honestly, it was a questionable teed on my end, but I said that the Saints kicking situation was the football equivalent of The Bachelor. A lot of contestants, not a lot of true connections. There's only one rose to give out. And no one's getting it yet. And I know that sounds crazy. I know you guys are sitting there going, man, this guy, Chris, watches The Bachelor, which, by the way, I do occasionally. It is a weird situation for the Saints because they tried so many options. They tried Brett Maher. They've tried Algic Rosas. They looked around, whoever got cut, and they were shopping left and right to see what they can do about it. But it just didn't work out for this particular situation. So I am really going to keep a close eye on this one. I don't know what's going to happen. The best we can do is hope that whoever comes in holds down the fort, makes the manageable field goal attempts, and doesn't, you know, isn't god awful to the point that the Saints are losing close games because when push comes to shove and you're in a one possession game, your kicker can't make the big kick. And that's something that I've been scared about for the last month. I'm still scared about it. The fact that they cut Aldrich Rosas now and they really don't have an answer does concern me. And that was the main takeaway. Those are the five, the thin cornerback, the wide receiver depth chart, them liking it more than us, the linebacker play, Tony Jones Jr., and the kicking situation were five for me that I just looked at and I said, man, I don't know. It it is going to be very, very interesting to see what happens there. But those were observations for me. Obviously, if you have others, drop it in the chat, guys. I'll put it up on the screen and we'll talk about it uh, here on the Straight Up Saints podcast. Obviously, since we're live on YouTube, live on Twitter, and then this will be posted later this week. So if you guys have any observations about the roster that you want to put up, get your voice be heard, let me know. I'll put it up on the screen and we'll talk about your observation for this one for sure. Uh, And yeah, I thought this was actually really interesting. So the Ian Book situation was so fascinating because I was so worried that the Saints were going to get really cute with it and say, okay, let's wave Ian Book, keep Trevor Simeon, and just claim Ian Book because no one's going to pick him up. That's not the case because the fact that Ian Book was apparently already receiving trade calls or the Saints were receiving trade calls about Ian Book shows that there is interest and shows that he is progressing better than people think. And who knows, if they had that third preseason game, maybe it would have been Book's chance to show what he can do. uh, And we just didn't get to see it because it got canceled, obviously. So I I think hopefully by the end of the, you know, midway through the season, the Saints can say, if something happens, Ian Book is your backup quarterback. But you know what? At the same time, Trevor Simeon does have starts under his belt. Trevor Simeon has been with the Saints for the last year and a half. So I'm okay with him being technically above him on the depth chart right now. But you hope that changes because if it doesn't change, then how can you sell us Saints fans that Ian Book could be the future, which again, that it seems right now like a pipe dream. But how can you sell that if he can't beat out Trevor Simeon? So that's something that I obviously want to keep a close eye on and see what happens there. Obviously, if you guys have more comments, leave them in and I'll get to them for sure. What about the fullback situation? Unless I missed something, we don't have it on the roster. So the fullback situation obviously was a concern because we weren't sure what was going to happen. But it actually got cleared yesterday. So the Saints, not only did they claim Adam Prentice, who was from the Denver Broncos, who actually is a three-time state wrestling champ back at high school. So this man is going to be getting down and dirty at the fullback position, which I can't wait to see. They added Alex Armour to the practice squad. So the way I see it, this fullback competition, which has been a thing for the last two months, is not going away. The Saints don't have a definitive answer, but I am glad that Alex Armour is not leaving because that was one of the only signings they did in free agency. And I was here to say that I liked it because he's versatile, but the saints don't have a definitive fullback, but they do have two options. So I wouldn't really panic about that. I think they'll figure it out, but it is a little bit on something on the back burner that you should consider. So fullback off in my opinion is something that you keep a close eye on, but I wouldn't hit the panic button about it because it's the saints. They usually find a way to manufacture decent production out of their fullback. Now, Obviously, drop in more comments, and I'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, But another thing I want to talk about in just a couple of minutes is the Cam Newton thing that someone sent me, which was just bizarre. Uh, But before I do that, comment here from Jabari. Tony Jones should be RB2, and if Harris gets suspended, 
then our wide receiver depth chart is, yeah, you're using that emoji now. I don't blame you. I absolutely agree on both points. I think Tony Jones Jr. proved to me that he has the burst you want from a running back two. And I think for the Saints, running back two has kind of been a concern for the last couple of years now. Obviously, Latavius has been getting the job done. And he, you know, it's someone that I have a lot of respect for. And I think he was underused the last couple seasons. But Latavius now is looking a little slow. Now, he did have a great week of practice last week, which is worth pointing out because if he didn't, then maybe he was on the roster bubble. So that is a good sign. But I think Tony Jones Jr. deserves to be RB2. Now, as for Deontay Harris, you guys are asking, is he going to play week one? As of now, Deontay Harris is playing week one, which is massive because he is that vertical threat. He has that guy you could use on the screen pass, on the end around, and he's also an all-pro damn kick returner. I mean, the man is great at flipping the field, and if you're going to beat the Packers, special teams is a big part, especially in the return game and having good field position to make your life easier for Jameis Winston at quarterback. I think that is important. So I don't think Deontay Harris is going to get suspended for week one. I think if he does get suspended this year, it's down the road because remember, guys, you don't really get suspended unless your case is sorted out. And Deontay Harris and Marshall Lattimore, their cases are still in limbo. And as long as their cases are in limbo, the NFL, technically by rule, should not suspend them. So I know you don't want to trust Roger Goodell. I'm not saying to trust Roger Goodell because, man, that I'll leave it at that. You guys know how I feel about Roger Goodell. But I do think that we should be in the clear for week one with Deontay Harris and for Marshall Lattimore, which is really good news because the Saints are going to need both of them if they're going to beat the Packers in week one. Now, again, guys, keep leaving your comments in here and I'll pull them up on the screen and we'll discuss. But before I kind of get to my last thing here, I saw someone tweeted at me a report from Jason Lacanfora and Lacanfora is a CBS insider per se. His scoops aren't always the best, but obviously people do trust his word from time to time. He put out a piece about Cam Newton and Cam Newton's potential landing spots. And one of the landing spots were the New Orleans Saints. And I was... So thrown off. And and let me just put a disclaimer out there. I absolutely love Cam Newton. Like, I've loved Cam Newton since Auburn. It was obviously very, very annoying to see him go to Carolina because then you have to deal with him for so long, and he was so good for so many years. And I am wishing him the best. Like, I do think he's good enough to still be in this NFL, and I don't think that he is a guy who is so washed up that he can't play in the NFL. I, I think that's a lie. But the Saints have no need for him. They have zero need for Cam Newton. Personally, I think Jameis Winston is better than him at this stage. And honestly, Cam, because of his physical limitations now, because of all the injuries, is at the point where I'm sure the Saints would rather see what they have with Taysom Hill. Whether it's right or wrong, they would rather. But with this season, we're riding or dying with Jameis Winston. That's the name of the game, and that's how we're going for it. So I thought the Cam Newton landing spot in New Orleans was a bit bizarre. I'd throw him anywhere else, in my opinion. I just don't think this is a spot for him. I think he's he makes more sense for Atlanta than he does New Orleans. So I was a little thrown off by that. And honestly, if you guys see it, I would disregard it because I don't think it's going to happen. And I would just put that report uh, in the trash, honestly. That's just my opinion uh, there. So I'm going to get to more questions and concerns you guys have. Do you see Lattimore shadowing De uh, Devontae Adams week one so our cornerback doesn't get toasted? Look, that is a really, really interesting point. And funny enough, Devontae Adams didn't play last year when the Saints played the Packers, and we didn't get to see how the Saints would have approached it. I think we will see Lattimore on Devontae Adams, though, because one, Lattimore gets up for these matchups, and two, if the Saints want any chance of beating the Packers, Devontae Adams cannot be running all over the field in Jacksonville making plays after play after play after play after play. So I do think that Lattimore will be on him. And kind of to your secondary point here, Al Lazar was beating Lattimore, and it kind of got to that point where we said, okay, does Lattimore take the secondary receiver serious? Well, if he's still not taking him serious, you absolutely throw him on Devontae Adams, and you'll see. I'm sure Devontae will win some reps. I'm sure Lattimore will win some reps, but you want alpha versus alpha, top corner versus top wide out. I would put Lattimore on Adams for the game, and if you're going to win this ball game, Lattimore's got to be as good as advertised, and if Lattimore wants to get a big check, He's got to show up. So this is a game for him to show up. Jabari's asking, any chance you think the Saints land another cornerback because we're likely playing Green Bay with Debo as number two? I would not be shocked if the Saints add another cornerback to the roster. I think it would make a lot of sense to do so because to your point, Debo would be two because Crawley's hurt right now. And even if Crawley's healthy, like I said before, guys, you have three corners on the roster. So I think it makes a lot of sense for them to go get another corner. Will they? I'm not sure. I can see it absolutely happening. But right now, you're looking at this cornerback depth chart, and you're saying, man, it is not very deep. 
It is about as deep as a two-foot pool right now. So I am not really sure how the Saints are going to approach the situation, but I do think it would be wise of them to look around the league. And remember, the Saints can make tweaks when week one comes around because Will Lutz is not going to play for a while. Michael Thomas is not going to play for a while. So that opens up roster spots for the Saints to tinker around with this. So I do think they should be looking in the market for a cornerback. But it's going to be interesting, and we still have a little bit over a week till this unfolds, so I will be back with another episode. I'll have a guest for that one. We'll talk about the Saints-Packers matchup what to look forward to, what to not look forward to. And while you guys are at it, if you haven't yet, go check out the latest video I put up about Marcus Davenport, who, yes, I have criticized on the Straight Up Saints podcast a lot, but I do think he is bound and primed for a breakout game against the Packers, and I listed it why in that YouTube video. So just go to my Twitter or go to Blue Crew Media's YouTube page, and you guys can check out that video. But that's going to do it for this particular edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast. Guys, I will be back with more content after Labor Day weekend. I cannot believe Labor Day weekend's already here. It's already September. Don't know where the time went. Uh, but you know what? I'm kind of glad because it's football season and we're here to talk Saints football every week. And that's what makes me happy. So thank you guys for tuning in for this one. Leaving your comments and concerns. If you have any more questions that I didn't address in this particular podcast, always feel free to hit me up on Twitter or Instagram and I'll get back to you guys as soon as possible. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, guys. Enjoy the upcoming Labor Day weekend and stay tuned for more content next week here on the Straight Up Saints podcast.